have in density and mass. Here's the density and mass. I guess before we think about force, we think about things first, you know, matter and the mass. All right, so let me start with the meaning of density first. So what I have prepared here is the meaning of the weight density of a solid model. All right. Um, mass density. That's the density of mass. Sorry about that. Okay. So how do you understand mass? I think it's a <laughs> it's not physics course. So I'm just going to take this crash um, in a short introduction to the mass. Uh, I think the best way to introduce the um, idea of a mass is um, mass is not equal, but it is uh, exactly proportional, proportional to number of particles, number of particles in there, fundamental particles, those quarks and whatever, the fundamental particles that takes up a mass, that has a positive mass. So if hydrogen has this many particles in that, and mass will be proportional to that. So when we say 5 gram versus 7 gram, these are mass. You usually understand as you, you hold this 5 gram and 7 gram thing and you feel that weight, right? But the exact idea of a mess is that how much of the stuff is in that thing. That is what this 5 gram represents. And 7 gram says there's a lot more things in it. Maybe it has exactly the same volume, exactly the same size of the sphere, but a lot more molecules inside and here, smaller molecules inside and there. That's uh, the notion of mess. Okay? In the gravitational um, field on the surface of the Earth, made mass is pretty much the same as weight, right? But when we put that in the space where there's no gravity, um, this mass takes in a place an important idea, right? So um, maybe you will just ah, you will just come explaining simple things too complicated. And here's the, the uh, why is it different? If you put that two mass five gram and seven gram in the space where there's no gravity, right? Newton's idea is a thing. It had some sort of creates an inertia. So seven gram has a strong resistance to move. There's no force, no gravity. Seven gram is sitting here, five gram is sitting here, exactly the same volume of the object. When you try to push the seven gram stuff, it takes more force to put that push that seven gram than the five gram. Intuitively, it's very difficult to understand. We understand this weight in the field of gravity. If there's no gravity, why on earth five gram is easier to push than seven grams to push? Only explanation you can come up with is the inertia. It's a part of some sort of physical principle. So if it is no forces acting on it, it has this resistance in that. And Einstein came up with a different uh, interpretation. Einstein thought time axis we use in calculus courses is actually the part of the nature. It's not the apparatus we came up with to kind of make things visualize. Einstein thought time axis actually exists. When the seven gram is hovering in the space, it's not really hovering in the space. It's actually moving through the time axis. Think about me throwing the seven gram ball to you, it's coming toward you, and five gram ball to you, and then it has this momentum, right? When you try to stop that ball of a 7 gram and you try to stop that ball in a 5 gram, in your intuition, which one do you think is, takes a more impact force? 7 gram in your experience. Think about the baseball versus tennis ball throwing at the same speed, right? So Einstein thought if it is moving through the time axis, it has that momentum that we don't see through our human eyes. So inertia is actually what we're feeling. It is actually moving through the time axis. It's actually moving with a 7 gram force, 5 gram force. When you try to push that to make it move in our three-dimensional space, you are feeling that momentum created by 7 gram moving through the time axis. That's a new interpretation, but it gives you a whole lot of different way of looking at it. That's what the difference of a mass is making versus weight that is in the gravitational force. So. That's mass versus weight. It's important to understand um, the force problem that is coming up. Okay? So what is mass? It's a proportional idea of a number of particles that is in there. 
and if you put in the gravitational force, you feel the weight. So here's another thing about the weight. I think it's a quite mysterious. I, if you know, every normal person wouldn't think this is m mysterious, but if you think too hard, and if you have a lot of time and think about simple thing too long, everything gets mysterious. You have that experience? So here's a five gram M1. Um, I'm using the larger um, picture to indicate that maybe it's a heavier stuff, a uh, larger mess. More stuff is in there. Then there's this gravity is a force created. It's not the uniform, but mysterious part. If I say the, the Earth creates the same force everywhere, that doesn't seem like mysterious. There is a force and there is a force. But interesting thing is that if you put that little mass there, the Earth creates this force exerted on that. It's pulling that. There's no string or anything, but Earth creates this force called gravity, right? How much of the force is creating? Something is pushing it down. So let's say there's an invisible hand on M1 is pushing it toward to the center of the Earth. And it creates a certain amount of force, F1. For the heavier guy, it's the Earth creates a different amount of force. It pushes M2 harder. Okay? I think I explained it. M2 is a he if M2 is a heavier, it takes a harder force to right, create the movement if it's sitting there. So suppose there is a switch on and off. To turn on the gravity and turn off the gravity. M1, M2 is hovering there, no gravity, boom, you turn it on. And then actually, so you have an individual hand both uh, both the um, object and you are proud to push it. Uh, principle, according to the principle of inertia, you, you take a lot more force to push that one in the same speed, M2, right? So the mysterious part is that the gravity creates a different amount of force. Little one, smaller force. Larger one, bigger force. That's what gravity does. And another mysterious part is that as you push that, it begins to move, right? But it's not like pushing it at the beginning. You just constantly push it. Suppose there's no gravity. And here's the thing is here. You just slightly, gently pushed it. And then it has a velocity and it's moving. And then you don't push it anymore then it's going to keep going, right? And there's no way to think that it's going to stop. There's no force that's stopping it. That's the idea of Newton. It's going to keep going. Now you follow that ball, the next moment, push it one more time with exactly the same force. Then can you imagine it goes faster, right? You push it one more time, it goes faster. Slightly faster speed is going continuously. Moment later, you decide to push it again and going faster. Decide to push it again, going faster and faster. Now, suppose your palm is stuck to that M, the mass M2, continuously push. Then the speed is a continuously increasing, right? This is called acceleration. The gravity is continuously pushing it down. Never stop, right? And then you get faster and faster, correct? All right. So that acceleration is measured, right? Do you know that acceleration? Gravitational acceleration? 9.8 meter per second squared. This is magical because it doesn't matter M2 is bigger than M1. Gravity is just pull, pushing it just the right amount. M2 a little harder, right? M1 a little weaker. Such that they're moving in what kind of acceleration? exactly the same constant acceleration, 9.8 meter per second squared. That's, a, that's crazy. It, it's just doing exactly such that. So that's the force, F, F2, and there is M2, right, the mass there. You know this formula? Force is calculated by mass times acceleration. It's generated by that force. That acceleration here is always a constant, 9.8 usually denoted by G, approximately, right? So this is a formula, and the gravity is just doing this balance perfectly. So that the force exerted on that, each of the mass, is just appropriate, just right amount, so that acceleration created by this force exerted on two objects is always constant on the surface of the Earth. But if you go further away, it begins to differ, but it's approximately constant but it's still interesting phenomenon.
All right. So, so suppose now you have this desk here, and the surface of this desk is very sensitive. It has a scale on it. It kind of feels that how much is it pushing it down, and then you put that M2 over there, right? And still, um, the Earth is pulling it down, and this desk and the sensor is feeling that force, right? The force is pushing it down force. That force is called weight. If you put that on the surface of your palm, and if you're feeling that weight, and that's the weight is created. So in this notation, it's trying to distinguish what's inside the mass versus what the Earth is doing to that thing. Does that make sense? Mass is how much stuff is in there, and this weight, like 100 pounds and you know 170 pounds, is the notion of what Earth is doing to that number of particles in there. Okay, so um, usually we have two grams. This g is not this is not two grams. It's two kilogram, right? Times gravity 9.8. That means something now. It's not two number multiplied, right? This is uh, 0.6, exactly 0.6. Is that 19.6? Right? Yeah, 19.6. 19.6 is measuring um, kind of magnitude of uh, the force. How, you know, how the um, Earth is uh, pulling this one down, right? And and they created new unit for that. What's the unit for this one? Kilogram times meter per second squared. This is called Newton N, right? When you say 19.6, or when you say 19.8 Newton, what's your feeling about this new force? This is a force created by putting what? how much of a mass on, on the surface of the Earth? One kilogram, right? One kilogram times 9.8? would be 9.8. 9.8 is the acceleration there. Okay, so 9.8 is is, um, is that. And the pound is another notion, and, and but this is a force. This is a force, not mass, right? So that's the important part to understand. The density um, of a mass is the uh, first thing we introduce versus weight. Sometimes there's a density of weight. Sometimes they um, they call weight density. All right, suppose here's the um, solid and made out of um, uniform material. Uniform material. Sand and glass, and those are the typical example of non-uniform material. But what is the uniform material? Iron, things like that, right? So you expect that wherever you sample it, wherever you sample it, that the number of particles, if it is the same volume, the number of particles inside you expect is the same. Okay? So it's a solid and uniform material. Make sense? So they go in and sample tiny amount tiny amount of cube there, or sphere. So let's say the, the volume B. It's a tiny volume B, delta B. And then they measure the mass, which is the information about how much how much the particles inside. So that's the tiny um, amount of mass in there, right? Because it's a small sample. And then you com they compute the ratio. Ratio there. And that's the idea of the density usually denoted by this Greek letter rho, which looks like a P, but is read rho, which looks uh, like this rho. That's how they write it. Okay? R H O. All right. If if it is a uniform material, and then you can kind of extend the logic. All right. If the volume of this one is V zero, then I sampled it tiny bit, knowing that it's uniform material. And you can guess the um, the mass of this uh, entire thing. The total mass, the total mass is calculated by multiplying this density rho by this entire volume. Extending, the, I know I have a little tiny sample there, 
um, you've got the information the ratio of, of that information and then you can extend it um, easily to that. All right, if I have all the other samples there, if you add them all up, think about it as a Riemann sum, they're all constant, therefore it's the same. So how about writing as a Riemann sum, total mass will be um, over there and tiny volume, um, tiny mass, all added up. If I dissected that into n pieces, let's say, you know, 2 million pieces, and adding up all the masses, that's a total mass, right? The delta m. But how do you solve for delta m if you have this information? Delta m is a rho times the delta v, is that right? According to that idea, if the rho is the same everywhere, the delta m is rho times delta v, correct? But we assume the densities everywhere is the same because of uniform material. So constant rho factored out and delta v going from 1 through n. So what is the answer for delta v, sum of all that? Isn't that the total mass? Sum of all that mass, uh, the volume of the tiny pieces, right? So therefore, it's rho times v0. That's explained. Any question? So this is the volume of that tiny pieces. And if you add them all up, it's volume of the whole thing. So if you have a density information, there's one sample, I have a density, and you can extend it, and if you know the volume, you can calculate the uh, total mass. If you have a mass, you can calculate the weight on the gravitational field, right? By multiplying 9.8 meter per second squared. All right, so that's the idea, and no, this Riemann sum turns out to be very simple to calculate when the density is uh, uniform, right? The idea is that what if the density is everywhere is different? like a glass and made out of a material, right? So here's a baby example. For example, one, two, three, four, five. Suppose that it's a rod made out of different material. And here is the weight density, row one. And this one is made out of different material. Connect them, glue them together. And row two and row three, row four, row 5, they have a different density, okay? So let's say the volume is like, um, you know, little circular, and this one has length x1, this one has length x2, this one has length x3, and so on, right? That's the length of it. Um, and then this, the uh, radius doesn't change, right? So I'm going to call that a capital R. So how would you calculate the total mass of this rod? Okay, so we know the denser of the first piece, right? Suppose it has a different color, so it's row 1 times what? Volume of that thing, right? Density times the volume gives you the mass. That's the, uh, the mass density is about. Make sense? All right. So what do we multiply? Volume. Volume is a 2 pi r squared times height of that tiny cylinder there. You, do you see the cylinder? Cylinder like that. That has x1 as a height. So x1 there. Correct? All right. And plus, next piece, row 2, pi r squared is the same because the kind of shape is uniform across it. The only thing is like length difference. Pi r squared x2, does that make sense? And you will just change the subscript all the way, right? To last piece is a row 5, the den different density, pi r squared x5. Make sense? And it's denoted rather using the sigma notation, right? k going from 1 through n, and pi k, rho k, I'm sorry, times pi r squared, which is common everywhere, and there's no inde index, and xk. Correct? And pi r squared can be factored out. Whatever this information, you calculate like this, and that's going to be the total mass. You can interpret as a weight. All right? So idea is that, all right, this xk, x1, I should say there was a, 
uh, sorry about this change delta x2 that's a better notation right in terms of the Riemann sum is actually the length of each pieces so sorry about that I'm going to go in and change that to all that to delta xk delta x1 there's a delta x2 there's a delta x5 and that's delta xk and book is kind of begin to ignore that part or absorb because it's a constant it absorbed into the density information so it gives you the density this on the length density and compute that thing but you have to be careful we'll look at the problem and try to interpret it as possible all right so general situation let's say that was so tiny um, length in here it's like a wire no more rod has almost no surface area and then and then there and we chop it into many many pieces right and then in the kth piece we have a density rho k and the length is delta xk all right whether you multiply pi r square or not whether it's very, very small let's say this rho density um, is a density with length rather as opposed to with volume okay if you go this much of the length it tells you what the mass is not the volume and tells you the mass so a uh, rho k is uh, calculated uh, the mass over not volume but the length because of kind of cross-section shape is uniform you could put that um, this much of information inside the um, density so avoid that kind of repetitive simple calculation so is volume dense uh, volume density versus length density would that be all right density of mass with length density of math with volume they usually tell you uh, so like that all right because of cross-section shape is uniform and that's what matters now in that case that the total mass is again nicely approximated if it is really continuously changing nicely approximated with the Riemann sum of the rho k with the delta xk if we have this length um, length density information 